All right, good morning, everyone. My name's Marie Wilson. I'm the Chief of Place and Communities Division here at Geoscience Australia, and I'm delighted to be here today to welcome you to the third Distinguished Geoscience Australia Lecture of 2024. Geoscience Australia values the lands, water and sky we work as we work to deepen a shared understanding of country and earth. We respect First Nations peoples and their enduring connection, contribution and obligations to country. Reflecting on our shared history, we are committed to listen and learn. Today, I'm on the country of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, and I acknowledge their elders past and present. So the Distinguished Geoscience Australia Lecture Series is presented by Geoscience Australia in recognition of major achievements of our staff in their contributions to earth science. So I'm delighted to introduce to you today, Dr. Rachel Nansen. Dr. Nansen holds a PhD in fluvial geomorphology from the University of New South Wales and has over 20 years experience in research and applied geoscience in academia, industry and the public service. Rachel has developed an effective communication system to describe her geoscience insights into a range of natural systems by developing standardised classification systems that help to bridge the communications gaps between research, industry and public policy specialists. Since 2017, Rachel has chaired Geoscience Australia's Marine Geomorphology Working Group and has led international efforts in seabed geomorphology mapping. As chair of the International Seabed Geomorphology Working Group, Dr. Nansen's team recently released a comprehensive classification framework aimed at enhancing accessibility and understanding of C4 landscapes for managers and decision makers. So please welcome, please join me in welcoming Rachel to the podium. Thank you very much, Marie, for that warm welcome. So today I'm going to be talking about how we've been mapping Australia's coastal and seabed geomorphology to support uh, our ocean economy. But the project I'm talking about actually started about 10 years ago on the other side of the world with collaborators at the British Geological Survey and the Geological Surveys of Ireland and Norway. Since that time, Geoscience Australia have joined with these uh, other agencies through our International Seabed Geomorphology Mapping Working Group um, to collaborate on the development of this method and these applications. So I want to start by acknowledging my colleagues at Geoscience Australia who've contributed to this working group and the products that you'll see today, but also my international colleagues and collaborators from those other agencies. This is the sum of considerable amount of work over the last uh, eight years or so. So a term that you're going to hear a few times today is the ocean economy. So I should start by defining that. The Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development defined the ocean economy as the sum of economic activities of ocean-based industries and the assets, goods and services of marine ecosystems. And this graphic I've illustrated here um, illustrates really nicely the broad range of ocean economic activities that make up our ocean economy. From offshore renewables, wind farms, through extractive industries, navigation, um, shipping, science, offshore fishing, uh, farm fishing and wild fishing, all these overlapping industries are, are working in what's now a reasonably contested space. There's a lot of overlap in, in how these goods and services are used. But as geoscientists, we tend to look down to the seafloor. We look at these industries and then we look to the seafloor to see how we can um, understand the controls on those assets that they're using and the sorts of impacts and interactions between the seabed and those industries. Can we figure out what controls the distribution of resources or the risks to those resources? So some of the things that we look at are interactions between infrastructure like pipelines and cables that we put in on the seabed and sedimentary bed forms. So you get your dunes and your ripples moving across the seabed. These will interact with those um, pieces of infrastructure um, in, in a myriad of different ways. We also see that there are biogenic constructions on the seabed. So things like coral reefs and the distribution of those coral reefs um, determines some of the ecosystems and the habitats uh, that are available to these industries and which these industries may need to be careful of in their, in their um, activities. And obviously ge geology underpins most of what we're looking at here. All the geomorphologies that we're, we're going to talk about today overprint what is beneath them, which is the geology, and the geology often outcrops at the seabed as well. So we need to understand um, geological uh, forms as well at the seabed. So now's a good time to provide another definition. I'm going to keep using the term geomorphology. And it's, it's not as uh, complicated as the length of the word would indicate. It's simply the landscape 
and the way that it forms. So onshore, we talk about rivers and coasts and the dunes and the, the floodplains that they form. It's the same out in the ocean. We're just talking about seabed landscapes and how they got there. So Australia has a vast um, marine um, estate. In fact, our exclusive economic zone um, is, is the third largest of any country in the world. The United Nations defined what is meant by an exclusive economic zone in 1982 at their Convention on the Law of the Sea. They define it as an area of the sea in which a sovereign state has exclusive rights to exploration and marine resources. And with much foresight, they explicitly included um, energy from wind and water. So pretty relevant to where we find ourselves today. So looking at the extent of mainland Australia, 7.7 .7 million kilometres of, of um, terrestrial landscape that we, that we have in our country, compare this to the 10 million square kilometres that we have in our exclusive economic zone. This area is vast. As I said, this is the third largest EEZ of any country in the world. And it's about the same extent as mainland Canada, for a little bit of context there. So with this vast estate come very large economic opportunities. In fact, the Australian Institute of Marine Sciences recently estimated that in our 2020 to 2021 financial year, uh, our ocean economy was worth $118 billion, which represents 4% of our gross domestic product. By way of comparison, for the same year, our agriculture, forestry and fishing contributed $102 billion. So it's a significant contribution to our economy that needs to be carefully supported. Slightly earlier, Deloitte undertook a study of the direct impact of seabed mapping and the contribution it makes to our ocean economy. And they estimated $9 billion back in 2018-19. Again, just underscores the value of the sort of work that we do in the marine space to support our sustainable development of our ocean economy. But with these um, significant opportunities in our vast estate come some uh, vulnerabilities and some risks as well. And one of these was um, illustrated uh, or underscored by the government's recent announcement of the Cable Connectivity and Resilience Centre, which is going to be set up. Because it turns out that Australia is connected to the rest of the world by internet cables, um, 15 of them. So without these 15 internet cables, we would lose most of our internet connection uh, internationally. And understanding seabed geology and seabed geomorphology provides a fundamental baseline data set that empowers centres like these to make informed decisions in the marine world. Risks be they accidental or intentional, to infrastructure like this. So onshore, when developers are making decisions or when they're even um, designing a development or proposing a development, they'd use a wealth of onshore information to even conceive of the idea uh, of where they want to put something and what they would want to put there. They would have at their fingertips usually a range of different geological spatial products. They'd have remote sensing satellite imagery um, and a whole different range of satellite imagery types from which they could map out land covers and uh, landscape systems. They'd have topographic data, so the shape of the surface of the earth, they'd have that at a variety of different scales. And all this data together would help them before they would even initiate a development proposal in the, in the onshore. And it would be um, that the regulatory authorities also have access to this sort of data with which they can make the assessments that they need to make about whether these um, projects should go ahead. Things are a little bit different in the offshore. In this example here, I've just put up a hydrographic chart. These hydrographic charts are based on soundings, individual soundings of the depth to the seabed from the surface of the water. And in this example here, you can see something that dominates the middle of this hydrographic chart is what we would call a ridge form, an elongate ridge form. And the proponent in this case was proposing to put in a pipeline. And because pipelines aren't suited to steep seabed surfaces, they routed it around the northern end of that particular ridge form. That was the best available data they had at that, at that stage of the project. But when they collected additional data and we were able to grid it into a higher resolution multi-beam grid, you can see that the extent of that individual ridge form didn't go anywhere near as far to the northwest as they had um, been led to believe. And they could actually route that pipeline a lot further south. Quite a simple decision, saved in $3 million. And this was 20 years ago. So in today's economy, that would be worth a lot more. And it's just one example of, of how geoscience data are foundational for the successful management of so many marine industries in our EEZ. So Australia's made great strides in the last decade in 
collating and providing marine data for end users. For example, on the left hand side, you can see our Oz Seabed Marine Data Portal, where you can go and, and look at the distribution of available data for download that's indicated in purple and other data sets that are in the process of being made available or which you can source um, from their collaborators that's indicated in grey. What you can tell from this image is that the, the availability of data varies greatly across our EEZ and across the Great Southern Ocean. You can see that um, there are lines that indicate um, the availability of data sets in these straight lines and what these are are swath tracks of individual vessel uh, transits going to a survey site or a site of interest. So we have high resolution multi-beam um, bathymetry data that describes the shape of the seabed over those swaths, but there are gaps in between. Uh, we don't have this coverage everywhere. Oz Seabed work with collaborators to also develop um, composite grids where they do modelling and um, interpolate the seabed depth between these high resolution data tracks using satellite alt altimetry and other lower resolution data sets. But, the, very, but the, the availability and the resolution of these data sets are quite variable. So when we're developing a seabed geomorphology mapping approach with our working group, we need to be able to, this is, a, this is a problem globally, everybody's in the same boat, we have variable resolution data sets. We needed to develop a system that could handle these um, different data resolutions. If you consider also the Geoscience Australia Marine Sediment Database, on the right hand side you can see a similar issue. The different coloured dots indicate the different sorts of seabed samples that are available that tell us about what the seabed is made up of, whether it's sand or mud. And again, you can see that these are quite widely spaced out in the deep marine, but denser around the mainland continent. But if you zoom in, um, even to those higher density points that you see around the mainland, these are actually still quite widely spaced. So if you were to identify a feature in the um, bathymetry data from the Oz Seabed portal that you were interested in and you wanted to know what it was made out of, and you went, to the Oz, you went to the Marine Sediment Database, you may find that there is no sample over the top of the feature of interest. So again, our methodology needs to be able to encompass this kind of uncertainty in the things that we're interpreting uh, and mapping at the seabed. So I just want to clarify uh, what I mean um, by bathymetry, morphology and geomorphology. These are three different uh, data products or data results. The first of these is bathymetry. So when I say bathymetry, what we mean are these grids that illustrate the shape of the seabed. In this example, the red is shallow, it goes down to the deeper blues, and that's the, that's the deep water. And these are great, these data sets for developing uh, morphology maps, where we classify the shape of the seabed, those ridges, like I showed you in that example earlier. Um, this seamount that you can see that dominates this data set and this is really useful information. It, it tells you about um, the slope of the seabed and the types of features that are there. And you may be able to start to make some interpretations about how they got there. But really, to get to the geomorphology of the seabed, we need additional data sets. Uh, we need backscattered data that tells us how hard and how soft relative to one another parts of the seabed are. We need those sediment samples that tell us whether we've got sand on the seabed or mud on the seabed. And ideally, we'd like to have subsurface imagery like the examples you can see here of sub-bottom profiles that tell us more about how the sediments stack on top of one another, on top of one another beneath the seabed. And when we put this all together, we can develop these geomorphology maps. Remembering again, the geomorphology means the landscape feature and how it got there. So when we can map geomorphology, we can tell you the likelihood of that, uh, of the composition of that particular feature on the seabed. We can tell you the likelihood of it moving and how it got there and how it's going to behave when you're um, uh, working in this offshore um, space. Most importantly, we can use maps of these uh, ge geomorphic units, these features on the seabed, to inform a whole range of different applications. We can use maps of the distribution of bed forms and outcrop to understand uh, appropriate locations for resources, for the fishing industry, um, to, to understand fish stocks. Others can use this to uh, use these maps to ingest into stability analyses and modelling of sediment budgets. We can use uh, maps of seabed features, which you'll see in a few more slides, to understand past environments, how this particular part of the seabed used to behave. And this gives us some insights into how things are going to happen in the future. And together, these um, more uh, uh, detailed geomorphic interpretations of the seabed and these geomorphology maps help managers to, to make decisions around the distribution of habitat and suitable offshore activities. So I just want to illustrate the difference in a, um, an interpretation of the seabed based on a simple ridge form. Just a simple uh, 
example here of a morphology <coughs> shape on the seabed. You can see the colours at the top here illustrate red is shallowest and blue is deepest. This is an individual ridge on the seabed. We can map it, we can put a line around it and say there's a ridge here. We don't need to know how it got there. But when we get that additional information from the subsurface, we can make interpretations about how that ridge got there and how stable it is. And this is really important because there are two very easy interpretations of this particular ridge form and they are fundamentally different in the habitat that they provide and the opportunities and risks that they present uh, to offshore um, activities. On the left hand side, we've interpreted this ridge as being a relic feature, it's a paleo feature. It actually developed when sea level was a lot lower. This would have been an Aeolian dune, so a wind blow in dune that developed on a terrestrial landscape, possibly in the coastal zone, when sea level was lower and it was further away. These sorts of paleo dunes become indurated, that's semi-lithified, they become hard, so that when sea level comes back up over the top of them, those ridge forms don't move anymore. And in fact, in this case, on the left here, you can see they're being buried by muds that are accumulating up around them. But the ridge form itself provides a particular sort of um, harder um, substrate for a particular habitat type. And that interpretation presents a range of different challenges and opportunities for uh, the emplacement of infrastructure. In comparison to the example on the right, had we not had that subsurface information, we may have interpreted this as being a bed form, an actively mobile dune moving across the seabed, quite a different habitat and quite a different range of risks and um, opportunities to offshore development. So Australia already has a seabed geomorphology map. It was created here at Geoscience Australia in 2008 by Heap and Harris. And this map has been downloaded hundreds of times. Um, and what it does is it provides us with really important broad scale context for all of these activities that I'm talking about and all these detailed data sets that we're now working on. If you consider the scale, the axes of this, of this plot over on the right hand side here represents these very broad sorts of scale maps that have very large polygons, very large shapes that describe the geomorphology within them as opposed to over on the left here, where features are much smaller and the resolution of those maps are a lot higher. If you look at the vertical axis, this is used to represent how long it takes those features to form. So the Heap and Harris National Seabed Geomorphology Map represents very large features that aren't really moving, these are stable. In fact, they provide a really good stable context for everything that goes on within them at, at finer uh, levels of detail. So as we collect these higher resolution bathymetry data sets and other data sets, this is an example in the Bass Strait of a higher resolution grid. We can zoom in on the Beagle Marine Park and we can zoom in further still and have a look at this one metre pixel uh, high resolution bathymetry grid uh, within the Beagle Marine Park that presents quite a different um, level of detail of the types of features that are present at the seabed. And what we wanted our classification system to be able to do was to not just nest within the Heap and Harris broad framework, but, also, but to also um, be able to support classification at these finer and finer levels of, of detail. So if we step out now from that simple ridge form example and have a look at a um, simplified cross section of our uh, coastal to marine environment, starting up on the left here in the hinterland, this profile takes us down through the coastal zone, across the continental shelf, down the continental slope into the abyssal plain and offshore we get these seamounts that rise up from the seabed out in the deep marine. If you consider the sorts of processes that can occur across this profile and the sorts of features, seabed features that form as a result of those processes, things can get pretty complicated. So starting uh, in the hinterland and coming down to um, the shelf break where our coastline used to be during the last glacial, so when sea levels were lower, our coastlines were out here near the shelf break and rivers flowed across the continental shelf um, there was no coastal process going on there at the time. Um, glacial processes in Antarctica similarly extended out across the continental shelf, forming all sorts of complicated features. Karst landscapes formed where um, rainfall would dissolve the carbonate material, forming caves and caverns and sinkholes. We see all these features on the seabed. If you consider also um, the bed forms that can form across the entire Cross section here, we can have bed forms forming from the hinterland all the way to the deep marine and over the top of those seamounts. Landslides can occur anywhere in this profile. Our geology underpins all of these geomorphic processes that can outcrop anywhere. And our anthropogenic influence uh, is also felt across the entire profile and potentially also cultural, cultural significant sites. Getting there, but if we move now into the deeper offshore, we've got our marine processes, we've got our 
biogenic processes that can occur from the intertidal zone to offshore uh, with reef development, fluid flow processes, and lastly, coastal processes as that sea level has fluctuated up and over our continental shelf over the last many thousands of years. That coastal zone has shifted backwards and forwards across the profile. So you put all this together and we get a myriad of different geomorphology types on the seabed. Um, 11 different uh, settings and processes in which they um, could have been in place by and therefore all these different features have different uh, characteristics and potential for um, movement. So this is very conceptual. I want to show you now a few examples of actual data sets that we've had um, to be applying this geomorphology classification scheme to. So in this example of the Flinders Reef, reefs in the Coral Sea Marine Park of north northeastern Australia. These reefs support uh, very biodiverse um, ecosystems uh, illustrated on the left. These seamounts rise up a thousand metres from the seabed. They're very large features. There's four seamounts here and they're very flat top. So that geological, these geological features can be mapped out as a first pass. They're the largest features. On top of these, because we're up near the um, sea surface, up near the um, you know, at the top of these seamounts, we have a lot of biogenic construction, so reef building up there. And you can see all sorts of geometries on there uh, that are the result of biogenic constructions. We can map out the landslides that characterise the, the flank of these features. You can see these large scallop shapes here. These indicate where a landslide has already failed. And some of these landslides are simply enormous. Remembering this thing, these um, seamounts are rising up about one kilometre from the seabed. So when these large blocks fail on the edge of those seamounts and they mobilise down the slope, once they get going, they can continue to, to um, be transported tens of kilometres away from the seamount. So that obviously presents quite um, a risk or hazard to seabed infrastructure, pipelines or, or, or some of those cables I mentioned earlier. So understanding the scale of these things is really important for analysts to then uh, take them to look at their um, potential for failure and even cyanogenic potential as well. In the northern part of this data set, there's a really nice example of a marine channel. This, these channels traverse thousands of kilometres across the seabed, transporting water, transporting sediment. They can be quite mobile and erosive. So this is also important to map out the distribution of these sorts of channels on the seabed to understand the impact they might have on um, infrastructure at the seafloor. Moving up now into the continental um, shelf area, so using our little uh, schematic down here on the right hand side. This is the Perth Canyon and it occupies or dominates the Perth Canyon Marine Park. We're looking at about four and a half kilometres water depth in the foreground and 130 kilometres away, about uh, 50 kilometres offshore from Fremantle, it's at about 200 metres water depth. So this 130 kilometre long canyon drops about five kilometres in about 130 kilometres. So it's quite steep. So we can map out these types of what we call shelf incising canyons and we can understand their processes are quite different to those that are occurring in what we call blind canyons out here on the continental slope. We've also identified sedimentary bed forms that are migrating across the seabed up on the continental shelf. These are up to five or six metres high. And within the canyon, we've identified a bunch of other uh, large dune features up to seven metres high. So fields of dozens of these, of these bed forms. And up on the continental shelf and down here within the canyon proper, these, these bed forms tell us that there have been some very high energy flows moving through here. So again, um, has real implications for the types of habitat that those settings support, uh, but also for risk to infrastructure and cabling um, in these areas. We've done a bit of a deep dive on this canyon, so we understand the geological controls on it, and these are really important. So this dotted line here illustrates the boundary of the Perth Basin in which the canyon is formed. So this canyon has flowed down and it abuts this, um, this basement high, this very hard basement high that deflects the canyon north and out through the continental slope and onto the abyssal plain. And above the canyon headwall, we've looked at the seismic data, very deep seismic data sets, and we've identified that there are three massive um, incisions, paleo valley incisions that were formed by rivers. And because we've got good age control in this area on how old these strata are, we know that the very largest and oldest of these fluvial incisions happened about 72 million years ago. We know that there's another smaller incision above that one, uh, where again, the fluvial system incised. And then above that still, we have one more that's dated to about five million years ago. So understanding just how ancient these incisions are, a really important context for understanding the risks or, no, or, or, or reduced risk posed by 
these almost two kilometre high landslides that characterise the boundary of the canyon. So this canyon did most of its work 72 million years ago, 35 million years ago. The communities of Fremantle and Perth, 50 kilometres on shore, um, will be uh, at less risk of, uh, from the, the result of these landslides should they fail, um, because it's going to be happening quite infre infrequently now compared to when the canyon actually formed. So really important um, management implications for understanding seabed geology. The last example in this whistle stop tour is of the Bass Strait. So this image you're standing on uh, above Tasmania, looking northwards towards the Victorian um, part of our mainland. On the left hand side in the deep blues, you can see this Bass Basin, a geological basin. On the right hand side, you can see we've got the Gippsland Basin. These are still forming bathymetric lows. And over the middle um, in these lighter blues is the Bassian Rise. So very shallow, shallow hard basement in here. And these provide the uh, the context for the ge geomorphological processes that are occurring in this part of the world. We have very strong currents that move from west towards the east. They sweep through the Bass Strait over here. And we also have very strong tidal currents that are forced through these straits down in the southern area here. These, uh, this deep blue area here is actually an area that's about 20 metres deep. These scours are 20 metres below the surrounding seabed as those tidal channels, uh, as those tidal flows cut through here. So obviously not a great place to put a cable, um, really important to understand that level of energy is, is just there immediately offshore Tasmania. So the bed forms that we see up here over the, the sorts of sand dunes and, and ripples that we see up here over the Bassian Rise um, take a few different forms. Some of them we know were formed when sea level was a lot lower. So when sea level was lower, the Bass Basin was actually a lake. We call it the Bass Lake. As sea level rose after the last glacial, so 10,000 years ago, it, it breached the western end of that sill. And the Bass Basin, or the Bass Lake, became the Bass um, Interior Seaway. So open to the west and not open to the east. In fact, this area here was the eastern shore of that Interior Seaway. And we see coastal dunes um, that are still on the seabed now uh, that flank that western limb. And in fact, at that time, this Bassian Rise formed a land bridge between mainland Australia and Tasmania. So these sites have archaeological potential as well. And interestingly, at the moment, um, if you look at the, this image here, this is a high resolution um, data set taken from uh, the edge of that old land bridge. See this large horseshoe shaped feature. These are some of these old Aeolian dunes that are semi-lithified and they're hard. These contrast with, you see the vertical lines coming up through here. These are actually modern marine bed forms that are migrating through the area. This is quite high energy coming through here. So in the lee of these old hard dunes that aren't moving, aren't going anywhere, uh, researchers found an unexpected population of Port Jackson sharks. So it's protected in the lee of these um, bed forms. It provides quite a different habitat. So understanding the distribution of these uh, different geomorphologies is integral to effective park management and for understanding uh, the potential habitats that are available um, within the parks. So I've used some pretty specific terminology now and there's hundreds more terms that we tend to use to describe these different sorts of settings and processes. So we've got rivers and glacial processes, bed forms and landslides. And most scientists would work in just a few of these areas. They uh, become quite dedicated to understanding the processes that form uh, geomorphic units in, in a specific uh, small suite, a subsuite of these different settings and processes. But as we we're developing our geomorphology classification system, we wanted to make sure that each of those researchers were using consistent terminology so that practitioners working in different areas or in different jurisdictions were creating maps that were translatable between users and which importantly uh, could be more readily digested by um, these various uh, marine industries for this broad range of applications. So what we did was develop a classification system um, that structures these scientific terms. We don't water it down. We retain the level of science that we need to interpret these seabed geomorphologies. But we structure them into a, um, a format that allows simplification upwards to the level that's needed by the specific end user. So we developed these, this new method uh, using what's called an oceans best practice approach. These ocean best practice documents essentially describe the most accepted ways to collect, collate and deliver marine data and are created through community consultation with our stakeholders and also with our colleagues uh, in different scientific disciplines. And we've created two reports. The first of them um, is the morphology report that helps you um, standardise the way that you classify that shape of the seabed. And the second report is how you classify the geomorphology uh, of that particular shape that you've already mapped. 
Both of these reports have been out now. The first came out in 2020 and the geomorphology came out in 2023. They've both been downloaded and viewed thousands of times. So we're seeing that there is some appetite for what we've produced here. And it's really exciting to, to be seeing um, it being rolled out. And these now sit alongside our National Environmental Science Program, um, other uh, best practice reports that help to standardise um, all sorts of marine data collection methods. Um, and it's essentially now a one-stop shop for ocean best practice data collection, collation and interpretation for proponents and for government and policy makers. So I'm going to give you uh, a couple of examples now of how we've been using this method to provide advice to government uh, and our stakeholders. So these two data sets you've now become a little bit familiar with, the one on the left in the Bass Strait in the Beagle Marine Park. We've mapped out the distribution of these different coastal and marine geomorphologies. Um, these help the park managers to understand the distribution of habitat, to reconstruct paleo environments, uh, and just improve their, their understanding of the distribution of ecosystems within their park, but also outside it in the area. Uh, the sorts of uh, seabed features that you might find in the Bass Strait are uh, indicated here. Similarly, up on the Flinders Reefs, we've produced this geomorphology map um, where we have part one and part two, so the morphology, the shape of these features, and then we also provide the classification of those features, um, which provide a, a range of, of similar um, insights into habitat distribution, instability, um, uh, paleo-environmental conditions, and again, to, to help uh, support park managers um, in managing this park. The offshore renewable energy sector is one of Australia's fastest growing industries at the moment. Um, CSIRO uh, estimated that renewable ocean energy will contribute up to 11% of our total electricity generation by 2050, and it'll be wind turbines in the marine that will generate over 80% of that power. So in another example of how we've been providing advice to government with um, pre-competitive pre advice to government is this uh, site immediately offshore Victoria, where uh, the proponent was interested in putting a wind farm the available bathymetry at the time um, of the project initiation uh, didn't reveal much about the seabed landscape uh, or its stability or otherwise. But when they collected high resolution bathymetry data and we were able to provide geomorphic interpretation of that data, we could see that this seabed's actually highly mobile. It's comprised of sand uh, being transported across the seabed at a fast pace by these strong, strong currents that move through here. Um, and this has implications for the types of habitat that are within that area of interest, but also to risks to potential infrastructure um, or challenges to infrastructure. Um, so it allows them to make informed decisions about proceeding with the project and also provides the regulators with uh, the information that they need to, to point out what some of the issues could be in areas like that. So now I'd like to look overseas and take you uh, to have a look at a couple of data sets overseas where our colleagues at the British Geological Survey and Geolo Geological Surveys of Ireland and Norway have been implementing this new geomorphology mapping approach. In Ireland, they've got 85% of their uh, continental shelf uh, seabed mapped using multi-beam data. So pretty high resolution data set and fairly continuous. They've just completed mapping the geomorphology using that data set and sediment samples and sub-bottom profiles and all the uh, ancillary data sets that they need to produce this map. This is a publicly available map. You can visit it uh, at atlas.marine.ie and you can zoom in and out on it and see the, the variable resolution of, of mapping that they've undertaken. So different features pop out at different spatial scales as you zoom in and out. Similarly, the British Geological, British Geological Survey have also been implementing uh, this new geomorphology mapping approach. And this map on the left illustrates a couple of green areas where they've already completed their mapping, some yellow areas that they're currently mapping, and some blue areas where they're planning to roll out this mapping classification system. So really exciting to see them implementing it. Again, you can visit their website to see the multi-resolution data that is um, coming from this mapping. But in a particularly exciting development, the BGS have been collaborating with the European Geological Data Infrastructure Initiative. And they've been making these hex grids that ingest the seabed geomorphology maps and other spatial data sets and social data sets into this system. And they provide um, an assessment of risk and an assessment of cost for, uh, to habitat or to infrastructure development in each one of these cells at multiple scales. So you can zoom in and out and the hex grids will um, modify their extent so you can get broad scale um, risks to, to development and habitat versus site specific as you zoom in and you can get more, more detailed level of insights um, into the, 
the, the cost, the stability and the performance of infrastructure in these uh, shallow to deep water environments. So I think this is where we want to head to ultimately. It's, it's a very exciting uh, step to take, um, directly informing um, everybody and the risks in, in undertaking offshore development. So I just want to give a little bit of context on, on um, where Australia sits in all this in rolling this scheme out. It's obviously really exciting to see Ireland have been so successful in rolling it out like across their continental shelf and similarly with the United Kingdom. But just remembering the, the extent of our landmass alone, it extends from Ireland's western um, continental shelf extent through to almost Kazakhstan. So, so this is just our mainland. Our EEZ is, is, is even bigger. We, we have a challenge ahead of us. Um, but we do have the method now. We know what we need to do. We know how to apply it. But we're going to have to think carefully about how we prioritise to get this work done. We're really excited at um, the opportunity to support Geoscience Australia's new uh, Resourcing Australia's Prosperity Initiative, particularly as they seek to, to find sites that are suitable for offshore renewable energy development. So my last slide here is just um, has some links on it. If you're interested in going ha and having a look in a little bit more detail about what we've been up to, um, the link on the left there will take you to the Oz Seabed webpage where you can learn a little bit about this classification system that, we're, that we've developed. It will also provide you with links on that page that will take you to our Ocean Best Practice documents, or you can go directly there using the middle QR code to get you to the OBP website. And if you just want to have a look at the mapping that we've done and have a bit of a play around with it, the QR code on the right there takes you to the um, ArcGIS, the Esri ArcGIS online mapping, which effectively operates in a similar way to something like Google Maps. So you don't need to be a specialist. You can go to that website and play around and have a look at these um, mapping applications at various levels of detail. So I'd encourage you to please get in touch if you're interested in implementing the scheme or if you need support in implementing the scheme. It's exciting to be uh, working in the, geomorph in the marine geomorphology space but we really need your help and we look forward to collaborative opportunities and supporting you to, to go forth and, and map our seabed. So thank you for your attention. <laughs>